grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that engages us this morning is the Gospel reading from Luke chapter 6 as Jesus continues his sermon on the plain. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Last week, we got the first installment of this famous Sermon on the Plain, where we saw Jesus declare and pronounce blessings on those who did not seem blessed. And in hearing these words, we see that the Christian is the one who dares to say, I am blessed, not because our present makes us feel that way, but because our future, the future that Christ has made possible, reaches in and shows us that indeed we are blessed. That no matter what we are going through now, Christ has already written the ending and therefore we can say those beautiful words. And then Jesus went on to say, or offer warnings against those who chase comfort in this life. We saw that there's a difference between being comfortable and being comforted. The calling of the Christian is not to be comfortable, but to be comforted, to comfort others. The calling of the church is to be a place where people receive comfort, not where people are comfortable. Why? Because the reign of God, now present in Jesus, brings about an incredible reversal And as Jesus continues to to describe what his kingdom looks like, how it operates, how those who have been brought into it behave, everything seems backwards. I mean, the Sermon on the Plain most certainly shocked the people who originally heard it preached, challenging the way they would be inclined to respond or react in certain situations turning everything upside down and backwards. Jesus, you surely don't mean that we should literally do these things. I mean, every situation is different. Christians have to endure enough in this world as we stand out with our differing values. I mean, don't we need to be protective of our resources? Don't we need to be looking out for one another? Shouldn't that guy be doing something a little more to help himself? How quick we are to dismiss what Jesus is saying here. To lessen its blow. To come up with excuses for why they don't really apply to our present circumstances. We shake our head at the beggar on the street. We give them all the same label that allows us to judge them from afar. We cling to our positions of being comfortable rather than being a people who bring comfort to those who need it. And yet Jesus still preaches. He paints an extremely clear and beautiful picture of what life looks like in the reign of God, in the kingdom of God, the one that he has brought and made possible. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from one who takes away your cloak, Do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone 
who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Jesus then continues contrasting his expectations for Christian behavior with the behavior of unbelievers. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. And by this point in the sermon, anyone who is in fact hearing what Jesus is saying can't help but wonder how any of this is possible. How is this realistic? I mean, on a good day, we might, we might be able to check one of these boxes. But more often than not, more often than not, these words come in and challenge us. These words meet a sinner who resists them. One who does not want Jesus to come into our lives, our minds, our hearts, and start rearranging the furniture. And just when you think Jesus is only adding to the list of things that we have to do and will probably never be able to do, the key to the entire message falls right into your lap. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. It all starts with what God is already up to. The heart that He has for the people He created, and all that He is willing to do do to restore their relationship with Him. It all starts with the heart of God, with the mercy of God. And we get a glimpse of this in our Old Testament reading this morning. The story of Joseph. Now, How many times do you think Joseph dreamed about what he would say if he ever encountered his brothers again? You know, his own flesh and blood who betrayed him, sold him off as a slave and told his father he was dead. I mean, the years this beloved son of Jacob spent as a servant of Potiphar, suffering the indignity of living far below his rightful estate. And just when he thought it couldn't get any worse, Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him of a crime he didn't commit, sending Joseph to spend the remainder of his life in prison. I mean, how many days behind bars did Joseph curse his brothers for taking everything from him? For putting their father through this great distress and grief of thinking he lost a son. And here he is in Genesis 45, no longer a prisoner, but the right-hand man of Pharaoh, wielding more power than any Israelite had ever had before him. Not only that, the very brothers who betrayed him are standing before him begging clueless to the fact that this powerful man who holds their lives in their, his hand is none other than their long lost brother. How sweet this moment must have been for Joseph. But if you had started this story a few verses earlier, you would see that Joseph isn't smirking and he isn't enjoying this moment in the least. He's weeping. 
undone. Letting loose a guttural cry so loud the entire household of Pharaoh hears it. I mean, Joseph is is unable to control his emotions as his heart processes everything. He has all of his anger towards his brother that is building up, his anger towards himself for feeling this way. The tears that are, are bubbling forth as he's realizing that the incredible all the incredible good that God has brought about, the, the good that he has in store for his people through everything Joseph endured, that it was all for the future of God's people, that through all of the mess, God was bringing forth life. You know, Joseph says to his brothers, come near to me, please. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. But do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me, for God sent me before you to preserve life. God did it. It was something that this moment, this incredible forgiveness, was something that only God could bring about. The only way to describe what happens in this this powerful moment Joseph has with his brothers is that it's backwards. That's not the way the world would do it. It's, It's backwards. But it's also pointing forward to a beloved son who descended far below the estate for which he had been begotten to spend his days in a foreign land suffering as a servant, wrongfully accused for crimes he didn't commit, not stuck in jail, but nailed to a cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Though he knew the answer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God sent Jesus before us to preserve life. And his own brothers, flesh and blood, threw him into the pit of the grave, but out he walked. No plan of revenge, no ill will towards those who wronged him and misjudged him. Simply an invitation for all people to come near to him, to receive forgiveness, to receive life in a world suffering in the famine of death, to be loved in a way that is only possible because his kingdom has turned everything upside down. St. Paul wrote in our epistle this morning, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The risen one has already turned this world upside down through his victory over death, and he is the one who speaks to you this morning not offering impossible demands, not simply trying to frustrate you, but to give you a glimpse of what He has made possible, revealing who He is shaping you to be as a child of God, who He has made you to be, the child that He has called in your baptism, the child that He continues to nourish and feed and give with an incredible, immeasurable measure of love and grace. What happens when the children of God live as children of God? They neither judge nor are judged. They neither condemn nor are condemned. They forgive and are forgiven. That's who children of God are. That is what they do. That is who you are. That is what you do. You who have been made alive in Christ. You who have been brought into His kingdom. You who have been shown mercy from your heavenly Father who is entirely unlike us. 
and yet dared to make us like Him. In the name of Jesus, Amen.